March is uh, March is shaping up to be a very busy month for all of us. Uh, just looking ahead to next week, uh, we have daylight saving time on Sunday, March 12th. Don't forget to move your clocks ahead one hour. I'm looking forward to this because I love it when it stays lighter later. And I really love that the clock in my car will be right again for the first time in about five months. Uh, what else? We also have our annual Illinois Association of State Floodplain Managers Conference in Tinley Park on March 14th and 15th. Uh, March Madness begins next week. And of course, we have St. Patrick's Day on Friday, March 17th. So please celebrate responsibly. Uh, I also don't want to overlook that Tuesday, March 14th is also Pi Day. Uh, as we know, pi is technically a mathematical constant, the ratio of the circumference of any circle to the diameter of that circle. And uh, we use pi to determine the area of a circle, of course, pi r squared. Uh, but who can tell me the problem with that equation, pi r squared? That's correct. The problem is that pies are round and cakes are squared. And take my word on this, if you eat too much pie, uh, don't don't eat too much pie. Sorry, don't eat too much pie because you will end up with a much larger circumference, a larger circumference there. All right, I better turn things over to Kelsey. But before I do, I want to remind everyone that you're muted. Uh, if you do have comments or questions during the presentation, please type those directly into the chat box and we will relay those on to Kelsey at the end of the presentation. Uh, so let me introduce Kelsey. Uh, Kelsey Gatone, hold on a second here. Let me, Kelsey Gatone is a design engineer and certified floodplain manager with Strand Associates. She received her Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering from the University of Iowa and is currently based in Strand's Joliet office where she helps clients evaluate issues, identify opportunities, and implement sustainable solution, solutions relating to stormwater and floodplain management. She is an outdoor enthusiast and enjoys biking, bird watching, and fishing along the DuPage River corridor. Kelsey is excited to showcase how the city of Naperville's bank stabilization project addressed the changing river characteristics while protecting critical city infrastructure. Uh, so with that, Mary Beth, please turn things over to Kelsey. Okay, well, thank you, Chris, for that great introduction. Let me just pull up my presentation here. And all right, can everyone see? Yes. All right, good. Um, well, again, my name is Kelsey Gatone, and I am um, a design engineer with Strand Associates. Um, and I'm here again to talk about hydro modifications along urbanized waterways. And really, I'm going to be using the city of Naperville um, to tell the story of how this community was able to address changing river characteristics while, um, while also addressing um, you know, uh, threats to critical infrastructure. Um, so with that, uh, here is today out, today's outline uh, for the webinar. I'm first gonna talk about hydro modifications. First off, what are they? Uh, why do they occur and how do they affect us? And then what are some ways in which we can mitigate some of these issues? I'm then gonna go into the relationship between the city of Naperville and the West Branch of the DuPage River. And then I'll provide a bit of a history lesson on the design and development of the South Central Interceptor Sewer, like what were some of the considerations that went into place at the time of design. Uh, then we have the evaluations performed along the river corridor and the interceptor itself. And then I have some photos to share from construction and the restoration photos. So hydro modifications, simply put, they describe how human activities alter the natural flow of water through a landscape. But before we can understand the impacts of these activities, we need to understand stream characteristics prior to human intervention. And streams naturally evolve their shape over centuries and millennia, just very long geologic time, to attain the ideal configuration transporting water and sediment delivered from upstream tributaries. And Lane's balance shown here on the left side of the screen, it illustrates the relationship between a stream's power as a function of its slope, how steep it is, how flat it is, and then the supply of sediment stones and cobbles that are present. And we can actually see in this animation that when balanced, the rates at which stream bed particles are transported match the rates of replacement by particles from the upstream sources. So the in equals out, and the size of the stream remains relatively unchanged. But that balance abruptly changes when urbanization replaces natural landscapes. 
and increased development corresponds to more frequent occurrences of erosive levels of flow. Prairies and forests comprise our natural Midwest landscape. Here we have a nice uh, Midwest forest here, and they allow rainwater to infiltrate into the soil, which recharges groundwater aquifers, and then also travel back to the atmosphere from plants and trees as transpiration or just directly back into the air as evaporation. The remaining rainwater travels to the nearest river or stream as overland runoff, and this is generally not that much. But with new development comes an increase in impervious surfaces like roads, buildings, and parking lots, all of which are imperative to our everyday lifestyles. But these limit rainwater's ability to infiltrate into the ground and then transpire back into the atmosphere. So the result is an increase in runoff. And then to accommodate that increase, rainwater is concentrated into gutters and storm sewer systems where it's quickly routed to the nearest river or stream. And I mean, think about it, when it rains, we want to get water off the roadway as quickly as possible so it becomes passable again. But these drastic shifts in runoff and the efficiency in which it's delivered correspond to excess, dis, um, excess dislodgement and transport of stream bed particles at rates that exceed their natural supply. So this makes stream erosion and then bank failure common symptoms of urbanization. And the, the combination of reduced sediment supply and increased flow rates associated with urban development cause stream degradation of the stream bed and bank. And when that balance is tipped, rivers and streams in urbanized areas try to find restored balance with new runoff conditions. And we can actually think about this as an analogy for our own lives and that we're constantly trying to find balance and uh, maintain that our own centers of gravity. And we always have outside stressors that are gonna be impacting that balance. So that could be work stress or you know things happening in your personal lives. And we're always trying to manage all of those things all at once and it becomes tiring. And in some cases you can feel overwhelmed and getting back to the river eroded. So this is a cyclical relationship in that stage one is true equilibrium. And this is where every stream wants to be. As characteristics in the stream change, whether it be a change in the grade and the flow rate um, or the sediment supply, the stream will start to downcut with the banks becoming more vertical and unstable. And then the banks eventually will slough in and the stream widens to accommodate that. Eventually, the stream gets to a point where it's wide enough that it has mitigated those impacts and it starts to slow the flow down enough so that sediment is deposited again and builds the channel back up. And this reforms that new equilibrium for that stream. But then the cycle starts all over again based on a new round of changing stream characteristics. So why do we care about hydro modification? Um, well, first off, it can degrade the water quality because the sediment loads that are transmitted into the stream impairs aquatic life's ability to live and thrive within those areas. But then also, if we're recreating along these different waterways, we're not going to be wanting to swim or fish or kayak, whatever it is that we like to do. We're not going to want it to do it in um, waterways that are impaired by, by sediment. Uh, channel widening can lead to property loss that impacts homes, roadways, and other structures. And in fact, this photo in the center is uh, from the Naperville corridor on the uh, West Branch of the DuPage River. So I'll be talking about the, the riverbank erosion affecting this area a little bit later. Um, but then we also have bank stability that can lead to uh, landslides or bank instability that can lead to landslides. And then in some cases, um, in more severe cases, loss of life. So in recent years, there's been an increase in communities that are pursuing bank stabilization work because municipalities recognize the importance of addressing hydro modifications from a bank stability and water quality perspective, but hydro modification also threatens surrounding infrastructure. So here are just a couple examples. Um, we have sediment buildup, which is limiting the flow capacity in this specific culvert. And then with one of the main flow channels blocked, water will find a way around this impediment and most likely onto the road, which um, can prevent uh, car passage. And then it'll continue to scour away around uh, the sides of the culvert, uh, eventually placing the road at risk of falling into the creek. And speaking of falling into the creek, look at this outfall. Um, it is completely in disrepair and has fallen into the creek. Um, and then the debris and sediments build up around the disconnected sections of the pipe limit flow capacity, causing upstream flooding within the storm sewer system. 
And then lastly, this large sanitary sewer. Uh, this is the South Central Interceptor sewer. Uh, it's adjacent to the river and erosion has uncovered the pipe and the pipe is at risk of rolling into the river or being damaged by large debris on route to the river from the upstream tributary. You can actually see that uh, the city uh, had previously put in some um, some uh, railroad ties here and then some vertical pipes in order to keep that pipe in place because they recognized that there was a real threat here. Uh, but I'm happy to report now that there has been a more permanent um, fixture in place, though this had lasted for, for quite a long time. I think it was put in in the, in the early 90s and had lasted until um, or last year actually. Um, there are different techniques that provide measures to avoid, minimize, and mitigate the impacts of hydro modification. These techniques, though, they really need to be evaluated holistically and applied to the big and small watersheds because just implementing spot treatments will only push the problem to a different area within the watershed. There are volume-based best management practices, and this is all about source control and keeping the water where it naturally falls rather than conveying it through pipes or channels that drain to local waterways. Uh, some examples of these on just like a small neighborhood uh, scale include rain gardens, pervious pavers, and curb cuts, and these detain a volume of runoff for a period of time to allow the settling of solids and associated pollutants, as well as absorption, biodegradation, and plant uptake. These really just foster those natural hydrologic processes. Uh, there are also flow-based best management practices, and these are designed to treat a peak flow rather than the storage capacity, and they treat water on a continuous flow basis. Some examples of these include vegetated swales and filter strips, uh, and then another uh, example is bank full detention features, which are located in the floodway, um, and they're designed to reduce the depth, velocity, and erosive power of the stream during events that would otherwise exceed the runoff causing erosion along the channel. This is known as Q critical. And a representative Q critical estimate is approximately 40% of the peak flow rate during a 24 hour uh, duration design storm, the recurrence interval of two years, but this is in the, the undeveloped condition. And then lastly, there are in-stream techniques, and these modify the banks and beds of waterways using natural materials to return the stream to a less impacted condition and to improve aquatic habitat. Uh, these also slow the flow, uh, slow down the flows within the channel. Um, some examples of these are rock riffles, and these provide habitat for aquatic insects as they start to oxidize the water, uh, and then also spawning sites for fish. Um, slow moving deep water can be found in pools where fish can find shelter. So there's uh, quite a quite a lot of different options out there. And now that we have an understanding of what hydro modifications are, how they happen and, and why they affect us, and then what are some ways in which we can mitigate them, uh, I'm now going to jump into the, the city of Naperville and kind of start talking about that entire process. Um, so getting right into it. The city of Naperville, I'm sure a lot of you know, is uh, located about 28 miles southwest of Chicago, straddles DuPage and Will counties, it covers approximately 38 square miles, and based on the 2020 census, it has a population of over 149,000 people. Naperville, it was founded in 1831, and it is the oldest settlement in DuPage County. In fact, uh, portions of the original settlement still exist today. Um, I'm sure maybe quite a few of you have perhaps gone and visited Naper Settlement, which includes a lot of the original buildings um, from that um, from that era. But uh, interestingly though, Naperville has seen most of its growth since the 1970s with over 87% of its residential housing built after 1970. And this also corresponds to the population growth of DuPage County, which uh, comprises the watershed for the West Branch of the DuPage River. This is an aerial for the city of Naperville around 1936, when it had a population of only about 5,200 people. And you can see the West Branch of the DuPage River winding north to south throughout the city. Uh, the figure also provides some landmarks of major roadways in the city, such as Washington, Hobson, Gartner Avenue. Um, actually looks like MODAF isn't quite uh, extended all the way down yet, but um, they provide some, some reference for, for the next figure. Because in contrast, this is an aerial of Naperville taken in 2020 with a population of about 149,000 people. And you can see the significant development that has taken place along the river and in this watershed. 
So over the past 50 years, the population growth in DuPage County and Naperville has changed the character of this river. River levels rise and fall very quickly over a much greater depth and the flow velocities in scour energy have increased significantly as a product of this development. And this has led to some significant bank erosion and continual creeping of the river, taking away more and more of the bank and the adjoining land. However, what was more critical to the city uh, was the changing river and how it was impacting the interceptor sewer. Because you can see in several locations, the interceptor has become exposed and is, is actually threatened by the river. Um, this kind of white part along the bank, that's the, that's the exposed interceptor sewer. So this is where our history lesson begins. This is the development of the South Central Interceptor Sewer. Uh, this exhibit shows the overall wastewater service area managed by the city of Naperville. And the city of Naperville owns and operates the Springbrook Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is located almost in the, uh, the southern portion of the city. And the treatment plant serves both the city of Naperville and the city of Warrenville, approximately 45 square miles in total and a population of 162,000. The city's conveyance system includes 22 sanitary sewer pumping stations and approximately 510 miles of sanitary sewer up to 60 inches in diameter. Um, this sanitary sewer includes the South Central Interceptor Sewer, shown here in yellow, uh, and it generally runs through the center of the city south to the Springbrook Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's on the, the left descending bank of the, of the West Branch of the DuPage River. Um, but the, the critical segment of the interceptor sewer, it's approximately 5,480 feet long, uh, starts between Santa Maria Drive and uh, 75th Street, and it ranges from 36 to 42 inches in diameter. It's shown here in red on, uh, on the exhibit. Um, this segment of the interceptor sewer serves approximately nine square miles and a population of over 34,000 people and conveys approximately approximately 7.5 million gallons per day of sanitary sewage. So this pipe is, is conveying a lot and uh, this is just to, um, just to reveal the magnitude of how important it was to protect this pipe. Uh, but the South Central Interceptor is a relatively new sewer and the Springbrook Wastewater Treatment Plant was not the city's original wastewater treatment plant. Um, so actually, as we zoom in on the critical segment of the interceptor sewer, we can take a look at the segment and go back in time and keep going all the way back to uh, this 1936 aerial of the, of the city of Naperville and the city's original central sewage treatment plant. Um, ooh, sorry about that, wrong way. <laughs> Um, so in 1971, the city began construction of the South Central Interceptor Sewer in order to decommission the Central Sewage Treatment Plant and convey the city's wastewater flow to the city's new Springbrook Wastewater Treatment Plant. And the Interceptor Sewer was constructed along the West Branch of the DuPage River and is shown in this exhibit cover sheet from the original engineering drawings from 1971. And it's not uncommon to install an interceptor sewer along a water body because usually those water bodies are the low point within the service area. But in the case of the South Central interceptor sewer, it was installed really shallow, which has caused some long-term problems for the city. And this plan and profile sheet just shows the existing ground contour at the time of construction of the South Central interceptor sewer. And you can actually see um, that the problem here is that the interceptor was installed with the crown of the pipe higher than the existing ground elevation. Uh, existing ground elevation shown here in that, in that green line. And this circumstance can be seen in numerous locations along the interceptor route, such as shown here, it's like a berm over the top of the interceptor uh, that's cutting off the upland watershed from the river. And in some locations, you can see where the upland watershed has scoured over the top of the pipe and has then exposed it. At the time of design, uh, it was recognized that this was a concern because some of the watersheds were large and somehow needed to get to the river. Uh, this map is just kind of showing the magnitude of those large watersheds. Uh, so uh, inlets were installed on the upland side of the sanitary sewer, generally at the low points. And at those low points, depressed storm sewers were installed to convey upland runoff uh, to the river. And many of these inlets and depressed storm sewers were installed on private properties. And in some cases, the property owners didn't know they existed. So they weren't properly maintained. You can see this one is just completely silted in. 
And then another concern at the time of design were the major creeks and tributaries that needed to be conveyed to the river. So similar to this location, the pipe had to span uh, this tributary area. And where they had these locations, they constructed the sewer on piers that essentially created a pipe bridge over the tributary. Um, this was the most significant bridge along the project corridor, and you can see that the pipe is supported by uh, concrete piers, and there's a lot of large debris underneath the pipe. In fact, a lot of people who are walking along this corridor would walk directly uh, on top of the pipe to get to the other side of the tributary. Uh, this one is actually supported by a concrete slab. So now we're moving into our river corridor evaluation. Uh, the project began in I believe in 2016, 2017 with comprehensive river corridor evaluation. And that evaluation started with a desktop survey and gathering of the history and development of the interceptor sewer. And that's what I just presented. Uh, a property ownership investigation was also performed to identify the land ownership along the route. And property owners included the Naperville Park District, uh, the Forest Preserve District, and the city of Naperville, and then uh, a lot of private properties as well. Uh, the interceptor sewer is installed in a 20 foot wide easement that runs through all of these properties. And a really important part of this project in the planning of various alternatives were these several meetings and formal presentations made to the Forest Preserve, the Park District, and then also the general public. Uh, these meetings were key to reach agreements between the city and agencies, uh, and then also concurrence with the homeowners whose properties we would be impacting as well. And then another critical aspect of the project was the detailed wetland and existing vegetation study that was performed along the entire reach. A field delineation was performed and it became a critical part of the permitting aspect, primarily with DuPage County, uh, because final permitting included requirements for native planting restoration, wetland restoration, and then also permanent wetland mitigation fees, because some of the proposed improvements weren't recognized as restoring of existing wetlands. So of course, mitigation fees had to be paid, uh, but we were able to agree to a five-year monitoring period in which the city can evaluate the work and, uh, and try to get some uh, wetland mitigation credit based on established performance standards. So in addition to the desktop evaluation, a comprehensive field evaluation of the entire river corridor was performed to identify the severity of riverbank erosion on a scale of one to five, with one being the least severe and then five being the most severe. And it was decided that segments of the riverbank that scored as three or higher would be restored. It was also decided that areas that scored as two that were adjacent to the higher erosion areas or in areas of other problems would also be restored. This is keeping in mind that any improvements need to address the river corridor holistically and not push erosion further downstream. So these are just a couple of representative photos of um, what like a two or very slight erosion, this one's more of a three might look like, three and a half. Um, it was also recognized that there were locations of severe to very severe erosion along the corridor, similar to this location where the interceptor is exposed along the riverbank, or then where the riverbank continues to erode back. In these locations, a vegetative boulder revetment treatment was employed, and this is where large stone boulders were used to stabilize the bank. And then between those boulders, we returned topsoil and installed native seeding to try to get the vegetation to grow back up and then uh, provide a deep rooted plant system, which would also help stabilize the banks. There were other locations with moderate to severe erosion, where erosion had cut the banks more vertically at the toe. And while the vegetative boulder revetment treatment would work in these areas, we also needed to be cognizant of the homeowners who would be losing more of their yards to the more shallow slopes of the vegetative boulder revetment treatment. So you can actually kind of see in this photo, there's a little bit of a vertical drop there. And so we wanted to um, think about ways in which we could provide a more vertical stabilization here. So we employed rock gabions, which could be placed more vertically at the toe of the bank, and then stabilize the upland area with a turf reinforcement mat and, uh, and native plugs. There were also locations in the backyards of some of these homes where there was significant riverbank erosion. And many of these backyards were uh, kind of turf grass or the, the grass that you'd see in most backyards. Um, and that shallow rooted system, it's just, it's really not able to hold on to the soils and hold back the river. So it wasn't surprising that a lot of these homes had lost um, a lot of their backyards. You can kind of just see it continuing to, to slough into the river. 
we compared the 1998 and 2013 aerials to determine the approximate bank loss between these years. And we actually found the homes at this location lost almost 12 feet of their backyards within that 15 year time span. Um, and we also reviewed past plats and some of these homes, it, it almost looks like they owned a portion of the river, but, but that's not the case. That's just how far in their property line um, used to go, but the river had taken away a lot of their, a lot of their property. And the, the issue here is that at this rate of taking away more and more of the riverbank, it's eventually going to uncover the sanitary sewer. And then that puts the, the sanitary sewer um, in danger of again, falling into the river. So in these locations, we employed a ledge stone wall, along with providing secure stabilization for this severely eroded riverbank. It provided an aesthetic to, uh, to this very visible portion of the bank. And as part of our discussions with the county, we wanted to see how much of these backyards we could restore, um, but we couldn't restore um, we couldn't really build out back into the river. So we are only um, we only had placed the, the stones kind of at the, at the edge of the river and could only get that kind of that four feet out. Um, and this hydraulic modeling, we performed hydraulic modeling to show that this wouldn't have adverse impacts to the to the river hydraulics. So the field evaluation, it also identified uh, locations where the sewer was exposed due to upland runoff or riverbank erosion. And some of the sewer exposure was due to loss of soil cover over the top of the sewer. And the field investigation also identified where the sewer, um, uh, oops, sorry, here's just a couple more photos of that, uh, of that exposure. Now, the, some of the most significant exposure was at these pipe dam locations. And these are places where the upland inlets and sag pipes were no longer in use. They had been plugged up and buried over. So the upland flow had no other choice but to flow over the top of the pipe and then eventually scour all um, away at the earth and then created a point where the pipe was actually acting as a dam. So um, here's one of those pipe dams that would block flow upstream. And then during periods of heavy rain, water pools behind the pipe and creating a wetland area and then the pipe starts to block those uh, overland flow conditions. This video actually just shows how close the interceptor is to the river. So it really just highlights the city's concern that there's possibility that the, the interceptor could, could roll into the river. These pipe dam locations are a product of a significant upstream watershed area, to, uh, similar to this area shown in blue. And, and we looked at a couple options, one of them being possibly excavating underneath the pipe and then creating a pipe bridge. But the, the problem with that is that at many of these locations, the sewer pipe was so close to the same elevation as the normal water levels in the river. So we would just be bringing the river back up into the upland area. So it was eventually determined we leave the pipe as they were, but stabilize them in place. Um, and another big part of this project, or like any project really that's going to be impacting wetlands or that's going to be impacting uh, waterways, is that you're really trying to find that balance between addressing the problem, but then um, not impacting more than you need to. So we were trying to be very cognizant about maintaining those existing wetland conditions, maintaining the existing hydraulic conditions, um, but still making sure that the pipe would stay secure and in place. So the plan then was to create a stabilization of the interceptor or a pipe cradle and allow the flow to continue flowing over the pipe. So that would maintain the current flow conditions and it wouldn't back up flow upstream and then would maintain uh, that current wetland environment as well created by the pipe dam. Um, as noted earlier, there are also locations where there are pipe bridges along the route. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier, people would actually walk across this one uh, to cross the tributary. And we wanted to address some of the upstream flow concerns. So the pipe itself creates a restriction in flow and significant velocity underneath the pipe. There's also this buildup of debris upstream, which could put a lot of pressure on the pipe and certainly during high flow uh, conditions. You can see all of this, uh, this debris underneath. And we understand that the 10 year flood event is actually above the top of this pipe. So when the flood waters drain out, it can create a lot of flow velocity and a significant amount of force on this pipe. So this exhibit just shows how large that upstream tributary watershed is to the pipe bridge and the significant amount of flow that can come through this location. This exhibit shows the plan view of the interceptor sewer as it crosses over the tributary. And to address the high flow velocities and scour energy underneath the interceptor sewer, we decided to go with a wire connected um, articulating concrete block. 
um, or I'm sorry, they were actually hand placed. They weren't wire connected, but they were on a um, kind of a, a geo grid to, to stay in place. And then the, uh, the run in and run out sections and the side walls of this tributary were designed to be stabilized with riprap tied to the vegetated boulder revetment uh, along the river bank. Then to protect the pipe from upland debris, the large branches and the logs, we designed these vertical concrete piles. Uh, so this plan or this profile view actually shows uh, what those vertical concrete piles look like and they provide protection uh, to the pipe for that large debris like trees and, and other big things that are going to be coming from the upstream tributary. Um, and then it also allows flow to continue down the river. You can think of these as like those, those traffic bollards that you might see protecting a, uh, a fire hydrant or something else that's adjacent to a street. Um, so uh, just to give you kind of a timeline too for this entire process, the city had been monitoring the progress of bank erosion since uh, at least since the early 90s, but it wasn't until um, 2016 that the evaluations had begun because at this point the city was really recognizing that this was uh, threatening the, um, the sanitary sewer pipe and they wanted to make sure that it would um, to address this before the pipe would fall into the river. And so design and permitting for the project took place between 2018 and 2019. And since this project was along a waterway and it affected wetlands, there were many agency meetings and a lot of coordination required to ensure that this project followed the uh, correct environmental regulations and, and uh, wetland mitigation fees. Um, construction was separated into two stages to limit the area of disturbance along the corridor. Stage one began in June of 2020 and was completed in September of 2020. Uh, and it was located between Gartner Road and Abrahamson Court and consisted of two pipe dams. Here's that stage one um, corridor. Uh, it also had um, 1,200 linear feet of vegetated boulder revetment and 500 linear feet of the ledge stone. Um, and it came in at just under uh, 900,000. Uh, stage two was located between um, Santa Maria Drive and Gartner. Um, and then they had another project location down here um, or Long Hobson and then 75th Street. Um, stage two included four pipe dams, two pipe bridges, 1,600 linear feet of vegetative boulder revetment, and then 350 feet of gabion stabilization. And I just want to reiterate that this project was imperative to public safety since the purpose was to protect a major piece of city infrastructure. And the, the city approved additional areas of riverbank erosion just kind of as a good faith effort um, to um, some of the property owners who had lost parts of uh, uh, parts of their yard, but again, it was it's to protect that uh, that sanitary sewer pipe from eventually becoming exposed. Um, and um, so, again, the, the key is really just to protect this uh, this piece of um, this piece of infrastructure. So the contractor started by laying down um, tracking mats. Um, these are the different uh, stages one and two entrances. Um, and then they provided erosion control along the corridor. Silt socks were used just to prevent sediment and other small debris from washing into the river during construction. And then the project limits were also delineated in orange construction fencing because we were really trying to limit the area of disturbance along the corridor to uh, limit the amount of restoration that would be needed, but then also just not to disturb more than, than what was necessary. Uh, for the pipe dams, they were, they were first uncovered and then excavated out. The, the formwork was placed and then the, uh, the concrete was poured in place. And then the, the upstream and downstream run in and run out areas were filled with riprap to, uh, or these kind of field boulders to, to stabilize the natural overland flow path. And then the area around the pipe was restored. You can see some of the, the grass and native uh, vegetation coming in. This one was interesting though, because it was actually on, um, on property lines. And so uh, per the agreement with the homeowner, we had to put the, the fence back, even though it was a little contrary to uh, kind of the design, but that was the agreement. So we did it. Um, here's just a couple more examples of that before and after. Um, and you might notice that um, so a little bit more of the pipe was exposed and uncovered, but the intent was to provide a stabilized path for water that was already flowing over the top of the pipe. So we wanted to make sure that nothing was going to come around and, and try to find another way around, um, around these, um, these wing walls. So that's why we uncovered a little bit more of the pipe to provide more of a, a stabilized path. 
Um, here's just a few more comparisons of the before and after. Uh, these were one of the pipe dams recently completed um, in 2022. And then do you remember this photo from the beginning of the project uh, or the beginning of the presentation? Um, now there is a more permanent uh, stabilization method in place. Um, and again, just to reiterate how close the sanitary sewer was to the river, um, we couldn't have 45 degree wing walls out. Um, otherwise, they would be extending out into the river. So we had to have uh, 90 degree wing walls um, just again to protect that pipe. But that pipe's not going anywhere now. Um, since the project has been complete, the river corridor has weathered large snow and rainfall events, and we've even seen sediment build up from the upstream tributaries deposit upstream of the pipe dams. So this just proves the effects of those hydro modifications, as well as the efficacy of the upstream boulders, just from a water quality perspective. And the upstream sediments then collected and settled down between those boulders instead of flowing out into, into the river. So this photo just kind of shows um, and shows a lot of the, the stabilization methods, the vegetative boulder revetment, which I'll get to in a little bit. And then um, we also had installed a, a couple of rocks just as fish habitats and then um, the repurposed some of these trees as well. I think this photo was taken on um, the, the 75th Street Bridge at Washington. Um, the, for the pipe bridges, this is that main pipe bridge and uh, the debris was first removed underneath the pipe and then kind of excavated out on the upstream side and then also on the, on the downstream side closest to the river. The forms were placed for the bollards and then the bollards were also poured in place. And again, these kind of look like those, those traffic bollards. And then the articulating concrete blocks were hand placed underneath the pipe on top of the geo grid and then tied back to the slope, which was stabilized with boulders. So again, here's some before and after photos of, of that pipe bridge. And you can see that the channel is just a lot more established now and protected. Um, the second pipe bridge, it was much smaller, but like the first bridge, the intent was to clear the debris underneath the pipe and then stabilize the upstream and downstream sides with articulating concrete blocks and then boulders on the slope. But uh, during construction, we actually found that bedrock was at one to three feet below ground, which proved a much more natural stabilization method than the articulating concrete blocks. So we decided to forgo the blocks um, and then instead cleared out the debris underneath the pipe and they stabilized uh, the sides with turf reinforcement mat. And then eventually that also tied back in uh, to boulders at the toe of the bank and then the, the vegetated boulder revetment as well. So the vegetated boulder revetment, here's just a couple more photos of that. Um, we had local inspectors out on site to make sure that uh, everything was being done correctly. And um, this outside bend along the river was one of the primary vegetated boulder revetment locations. Um, if you recall, part of our design was to pack in the boulder revetment with topsoil uh, and then to replant it with native grass seeding because we, um, we wanted the, the deep-rooted um, plant systems to help stabilize the bank. And then also we we're endeavoring to, uh, to get uh, on-site wetland mitigation credits. So this is after one month. Um, I think the vegetation was starting to come along well, and this was in October of, uh, of that same year. So uh, the cover crop was coming in. Um, you'll notice that we also installed rock veins out into the river. And uh, the intent of these rock veins were to create an eddy that uh, forces the flow and scour energy back out into the river, just as opposed to scouring the, the bank of the river. Uh, the stone gabions, these were used to address moderate to severe erosion with the vertical cuts at the toe of the bank. Uh, the turbidity barriers were first placed in the river before the excavation and then clearing of the bank. Um, and then the, uh, the gabions were placed and then the slope um, returned back. So here's just some before and after of those gabions. Uh, and you can see again, just how steeply uh, cut the, the bank is in that first photo. Um, restoration of this portion of the project will commence in, in the spring with uh, the installation of native plugs. Um, again, deep rooted plant systems to help stabilize that bank even more. The lead stone wall treatment, uh, this was used along the backside of the properties who had experienced significant backyard loss. This was that uh, 12 feet within 15 years rate. Uh, and we'd ultimately started with the thought of using prefabricated stone, um, kind of a stone wall system, but we also ultimately decided to go with cut stone 
Um, these stones are very big and very heavy, uh, so they therefore provide a lot of vertical stability. And they were placed on top of a three inch stone base. Uh, the backsides were backfilled, and then they generally went up two to three layers of block just to match existing grade. And then the, the ground was restored. And we got a lot of compliments back from the residents on the restoration, uh, just to have a little bit more of a, a stabilized wall. Um, and across the, the stream too is uh, Pioneer Park. So you can um, again see that this is a very visible portion. So we wanted to make sure that it was kind of uh, natural and aesthetically pleasing kind of for all users of the trail. Uh, there are some locations uh, with uh, local storm sewers that were tributary to the river. Uh, and this is actually a storm sewer that goes underneath the interceptor at this particular location. It was one of those depressed storm sewers, uh, but it had a tendency to blow out during heavy storm events. And, and actually, this is just kind of a comparison between when we first started evaluating the project in 2017 to when construction started for the project in 2020. You can see how much erosion has happened just within that uh, three-year time span. Um, so it was also creating more erosion along the top of the pipe. So we wanted to make sure that these got addressed uh, during construction as well. We had some spot stabilization work to complete um, and just to provide an overland flow path to the river. Uh, there were other storm sewer outfalls and disrepair that were reconstructed and then also tied back in to the stabilization treatment. Um, this one in particular, I believe was uh, north of Gartner Road and was completed in, in, in 2022. But again, you can just see the pipe completely fallen in. Um, and that's because the bank has continued to erode back and with nothing keeping the, the, uh, the pipe in place, it's just gonna fall into the river. Uh, tree removal was an important part uh, along this corridor. And because one of the main reasons why the bank was having such a hard time stabilizing was that the vegetation couldn't grow underneath the tree canopy. The canopy was blocking the sunlight. So it was necessary for us to clear out the canopy and then some of these trees and then to allow that vegetation to grow back in. So you can see that, uh, again, we tried to repurpose some of these to, uh, trees that were felled to be used uh, as a tree habitat. And then eventually all of this tied back in to the vegetated boulder abetment and then the, the ledge stone, at least at this, this location as well. So lastly, I'm just gonna provide a little update on uh, the, the restoration portion. Um, following completion of stage one of the project, the city began a five-year restoration monitoring and maintenance program. Uh, the first year of reporting was completed in 2021, and the second year was just completed in 2022. So I thought I'd just provide an update on how it's coming along. Um, so if you recall, a critical part of the project stormwater permit with DuPage County was mitigating impacts to wetlands and buffers, and areas were restored and stabilized in a linear fashion, and disturbance to wetlands and buffers were minimized by staying within the designated project limits and otherwise following best management practices. So in efforts to provide on-site mitigation, we implemented naturalized stream bank stabilization techniques where they were appropriate, and then restored the remaining areas disturbed during construction with nature native plantings. So we worked with DuPage County to uh, develop vegetation performance standards that must be met at the end of each year. So then to determine if the vegetation met those year-end performance standards, uh, we performed a field review in the spring and fall of 2021 and 2022 using four 10 foot by 10 foot quadrats documenting the native seeding progression. Here's just an example of quadrat one. So uh, we first started by doing that field delineation of that, that 10 foot by 10 foot area. So here's just a side by side of the progression from years one uh, to years two. Um, so we were documenting the, the species that were within that 10 foot by 10 foot area, and then as well as the, the weed coverage. Uh, so we took photos uh, kind of documenting all sides of it, facing east in this one, uh, west towards the river in this uh, photo, um, and then kind of heading south. So you can start to see that um, more of the, the native grasses were starting to come up and less of the cover crop, but uh, there will be some weed maintenance required in the, in the following year. Um, we also documented the vegetation progression in the vegetative boulder abetment uh, areas as this stabilization measure endeavored to provide um, some on-site uh, mitigation credit. Um, and again, we have some blue stem coming in in this photo. So the, the native plantings are starting to be more established in this area. 
And then lastly, uh, we documented the health of the trees and shrubs that were planted as part of the landscaping plan. So overall, the vegetation performance standards were met with minor weed trimming and, and management required in, uh, in 2022. So since this project uh, and the restoration has started to begun, we've seen a resurgence in wildlife. Um, we have a, a turtle here that's enjoying um, the, the, the native seeding as part of uh, the stage one of the project. Um, and of course, we always have deer along the project corridor. Um, but thank you everybody for sticking with me until the end and uh, for taking time in your lunch hour to be a part of this presentation. I'll happily take any questions if there are any. Hey, great job. I Looking at all those slides, I didn't think there was any way you were going to be able to finish uh, on time here. And uh, <laughs> you did some, that's a lot of information. Great job. Great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions that came in. Let me, uh, let me uh, share some of those with you. Uh, let's see. So did any sewage leaks occur before the project was completed? No, um, at least not in this portion of the project. All right, well, that's, yeah, that's good, good news. Uh, the next thing is just kind of a comment. The, the county provided 500,000 in ARPA funds to the city for this project. And yeah, so we were, we were happy to do that. That was through our ARPA program. Uh, the county ended up giving out uh, uh, over $8 million for, for uh, you know, various projects throughout the county to, uh, for 26 different projects uh, in, in a lot of the communities in DuPage County. So thank you for uh, recognizing that. Uh, here's another question. Uh, what kind of long-term maintenance do you expect for the pipe bridges? Um, I think a lot of that is just going to be debris clearing. Um, there's going to have to be some uh, debris removal, especially for the, that large pipe bridge that had the bollards on it, to just make sure that the trees are going to be removed out of that area. And then um, every now and again, some um, removal of, of sedimentation. Okay, very good. Um, here's another. Uh, was this work completed under an existing utility easement or were additional easements needed, uh, particularly over the residential lots? There, so there is a, a 20 foot um, easement on the pipe. So that's, that, that would be the utility easement, but we had to get temporary um, easements for property access in order to actually get to the pipe. Uh, did you encounter issues with FEMA regarding placement of gabions and uh, the large stone blocks in the floodway? No, um, we had, um, I believe during the permitting process, the, the Office of Water Resources had deferred uh, to the county. And so we had worked with uh, DuPage County on the, the FEQ modeling. And then um, I think also HECRES modeling was completed to just make sure that there weren't going to be any adverse impacts with no the, adverse the impact. placement. Very good. Uh, and then there was a follow-up question on that. Um, uh, what permits did you need from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers? So this was, we ended up having to kind of go back to the Army Corps twice because the, the first time, I think it was one of their, their regional permits, and I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was, but then by the time we did stage two, um, the first permit had expired, so we had to go back um, and I believe this one was also in the process when uh, the Army Corps was switching from the to the regional to the, the nationwide permits. Um, so again, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I can happily provide that information um, sure. on which ones were uh, pursued. Okay, very good. Um, here's one from Alex. What is the design life of the interceptor sewer and how did, the, uh, how did that impact the design of the pipe dams and bridges? Uh, of the interceptor sewer itself, I do not know. I don't have that answer. Okay. And here's one from Mary Lou. Uh, um, were any payments made to property owners uh, for the easements and land loss access? Um, other than just the um, the for the easements, no. I think there were, um, we had to pay for for tree removal on some of the properties, but um, other than that, no. No, okay. Um, how about, you know, as far as like restoration goes, uh, 
in the residents' backyards, you know, you were showing that a, a lot of it was turf grass, and then uh, maybe you were mixing in some native uh, plants and seeding, uh, you know, in the in the proposed uh, uh, situation there. W were there any complaints from the homeowners that they that they wanted to have the the turf grass back so that they, they could maybe see the river still, or were there, were there any kind of uh, complaints or issues like that? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, that that was why we had to have those the conversations with the property owners too. So uh, the ones that didn't have um, kind of the the native plantings there already weren't expecting there to have native plantings in the end. Um, but it also worked out because the the ledge stone, at least in that that twelve. Uh, foot property loss area uh, provided more stability in that specific area um, than the, at least in the vegetative boulder revetment, which we needed just for that specific area. The areas where we employed the, uh, the gabions, um, because again, there was like that vertical cutback, um, the, we were working with the homeowners to make sure that they were okay with having more of a, a native slope in that area. And, and because it was, um, you know, a little bit lower down than what they could actually see from their houses. They were okay with that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then Lucy made the comment that I bet those property owners were ecstatic to have this restoration work done. So yeah, they probably didn't have too much to complain about because they weren't going to be losing any more of their property uh, with right. this project. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, will the city perform any ongoing maintenance and management of the native plantings on private property? Um. Well, on, on private property, at least for the, the five-year maintenance and monitoring um, as part of the permit, they will. But after that, no, that's, that's on the homeowners. All right, very good. I think, I think that's all the, uh, the questions and comments that I see. I see Mary Lou also said fantastic presentation. I want to agree with that. Um, uh, so again, I want to thank you one more time for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Uh, I'd like to also thank all of our guests here for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed and learned a few things from this webinar. Uh, please remember Mary Beth will email everyone with a link to the presentation, uh, recording of the webinar, and of course that very valuable PDH certificate. Our next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, April 13th at noon, where Nick Fuller from Natural Communities will present Flywheel Ecology. Uh, so registration information for that will follow shortly, uh, and we hope to see everyone there. So again, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Thanks, everyone.